Hi guys, I'm Bobsy, and in this video we're going to first of all look into adding collision events to the player and then after that I think we should add, go into adding some kind of health and a health bar so we can also see how to work with visuals. So here you can see now when we hit each other not really a lot happens and that's because well it's just normal physics right so we just push each other there's not a lot of bounce and as with normal unity we could technically go ahead and make a, a physics material make it more bouncy and we indeed bounce more of each other but I want to be able to control it a little bit more as a strict knockback. So let's go into our script and let's start working on that. First off, let me just show you that with the predicted rigid body, you have this event mask here, which is essentially which events uh, actually run. By default, it's just everything to avoid some kind of confusion. But actually for optimization, you could only run the events that you actually use. Um, but I think for now, and especially while building and testing, just keep it to everything. Um, and then let's go into here where we have our predicted rigid body and our movement. Uh, and let's go ahead and let's make an on enable and on disable. So in on enable, we want to grab our rigid body. And if you write that on, you'll see all the callbacks. These callbacks will seem oddly familiar, probably very familiar to the Unity ones. And that's because we've decided to keep the naming to make it, well, very easy to remember and know exactly what they do. And they do exactly what you think they do. The only difference and the only reason why you want to do it through the predicted rigid body is because they do need to act with the prediction loop. Uh, and that's why we have to use them through here and not Unity's own collision detection. So if we just go in here and we just subscribe to this and you can go ahead and call it on collision enter. The thing is Unity will be angry at you for this. It'll essentially just say that it's the wrong method and so on. So I'm just going to call it on collision start. And then I can have uh, my IDE just automatically create that method for me, which takes some game object, which is the one we've hit. And it takes some kind of collision event data. Uh, and now let's just go into on disable and just unsubscribe again. So we make sure we do that cleanly. Just add a little minus there, and there we go. Now we're subscribed and unsubscribed from the collision events, and now we can handle it how we want to. Now let's go ahead and also just add some kind of knockback force. Let's do something like that. And then down here, it's really as easy as you would work with normal Unity. So first of all, I guess let's check if it's even another player that we've hit. So if it is not other dot try get component out player movement other player, for example, then we return, which means you know we did not hit another player. But that means when we're here, we have hit another player. So let's start by calculating the direction. And we can do that by just doing normal direction calculations. So we could, for example, take our transform.position and subtract the other.transform.position from that. And let's just normalize that as well. And this will give us the direction away from the other player. You can, of course, inverse these or for that sake, just inverse the whole thing and you'll get the direction towards the other player. And then we just do rigidbody.addForce with the direction times the knockback force. And then, of course, we want it to be a force mode impulse because, you know, similar to a jump, it's sort of a burst of force that we want to add. And that's it. That should really be all. Now we've added knockback successfully to our game. So let's just go ahead and test that. And we'll go ahead and hit play. And you can see now when they touch each other, indeed, we have knockback. So, yeah, it's really as easy as that to add knockback to this. And hopefully you can see how similar to almost just developing in single player it really is to work with prediction. Cool, so now we have well-functioning knockback. Now let's get into working on the actual health. Now, first of all, let's just set up a little, uh, very simple health bar above the player. And we can just do that under the visuals to make sure that it's smooth. But in fact, that won't really matter a lot, and I'll show you in a little bit. So let's just go ahead into UI, and let's add a world space canvas to the player. So I'm just going to make this, uh, I guess, player canvas, we can call it whatever. And let's make that world space, and let's just set that up how we want it. There we go. So now we have our canvas here closer to the player. Now let's also just go ahead and add the slider. So let's go in here and I'll add the slider. Uh, and I'll really just set this up very quickly as a health bar above the player and all that. Now other than this, let's also very quickly just make sort of an extra script that can just always keep an offset and looking at the camera. The reason for this and the reason why we want this script is because the ball will be rolling around a lot. So as the ball roll around, obviously the canvas will be rolling with it. And I don't want that. I want the canvas staying right on the player and I want it staying uh, above. Well, I guess in this case it's above, but I want it to keep its rotation or look at the camera, whatever really. Okay, cool. So I've just quickly gone ahead and made a script here that essentially just in a way grabs the cat main camera and in the, uh, just do that safety. 
And then in late update, we'll essentially just grab the direction from the camera uh, to the player and then just set the X direction to make sure it doesn't rotate from left and right and then just set the look rotation of the transform that we're on. And this pretty much works. So now when I hit play, you can see when I move around, the uh, the health bars are to pretty much stay above the player on the screen where I want them. Cool. So now that, that works, let's actually get to adding some actual health to the player. So let's go and make a script and let's just call that player health. Now inside of player health, let's also go ahead and make this a predicted identity. However, this one, we only actually need to hold state. So let's go ahead and make ourselves a state. So let's make a public struct, call this state. And this will be of I predicted data of type state. There we go. And of course, this will be player health dot state that we're using in here. And of course, as also, we need to implement the dispose method in here. Cool. So now that we have the basic setup, let's just, uh, for example, let's start by giving ourselves some actual starting health. So let's do some serialized field, private, int. Let's do max health, for example. And let's set that to 100. And now in here, let's just make a public int that we can call health. Now, first of all, we obviously need to set this health. And given that it's a state, we cannot just set this equal to 100. Or sorry, given that it's a struct, we cannot set this. It doesn't have a strict setter in here, which means we need to do override the get initial state. And when overriding this, we need to return a state. So all we can do now is just return new state. And we need to just essentially create this in here. Everything that we have right now is just health. And that's uh, equals to max health. And this will now be the initial state that we're getting. That will be health will be set equals to max health. And it's really that easy. We now need to figure out how do we actually change the health and how do we react to it? And also how do we display it on our UI? So let's start by actually getting the health to change. And how we could do that is right now, for example, in player movement, we are handling the hit. Um, I guess we could also just subscribe to the rigid body, but I guess let me just show you uh, how we can interact between scripts. Normally, I'll probably have the health uh, itself subscribe to the rigid body event. But in this case, let's try and have the player movement call it on the player health, just so I can show you that that works just fine as well. So let's do a serialized field, private, uh, and let's just get the player health, and this will be the player health, right? This is just so it has a reference to its own player health. You could also do a get component to get it or whatever if you want cleaner uh, editor uh, a clean inspector but in my case i don't really care much uh, okay so here when we hit other player we can just call player health dot hit other player and we can call it with that so now let's go and make hit other player inside the player health so let me make a public void hit other player and now we can decide what happens here so we can for example make a private int that can just be called damage uh and in our case, I think the damage is just a static number. Therefore, it's fine to have it here. If it wasn't a static number, we'd of course need it in the state. But since it's just a static, it's just always going to be 10 or 20 or whatever we want it to be. That'll work just fine. And all we need to do here is notice how we're not in we're not in the simulate loop right now, right? Like when you're in simulate, as I've told you before, this is where you essentially want to modify the state. You'd want to do state.health minus equals to damage, for example. This is how you'd normally do it, but we don't actually have the state in here. So how do we do that? Well, it's fortunately for us very easy because we're still actually in the simulate loop. So we can just do current state dot health minus equals to underscore damage. And it's that easy because the current state is still like the, the hit other player is still part of the simulate loop. And the get the current state here is pretty much the same as the one that's here, which means when we go uh, back here, you can see it comes from the on collision enter, which because we're getting it through this is part of the prediction loop, which is then going in here. And because we're still part of the prediction loop, we can also just modify here. So essentially, as long as everything somehow links back to the prediction loop, you can modify your state and stuff as wildly as you want. Now, it might seem very natural to then also handle the visuals here. So let's also try to do that. Let's try and do serialized field, private, let's do slider. And this will be the health slider. Um, and let's also just first of all let's try and debug uh, how this also looks so let's try and do debug.log new health is current state dot health and let's try and only do this if we are the owner just so we only log it for ourselves so we don't see way too many logs and then we can also do the health slider dot value equal to and we can build it essentially into a float whoops we can essentially build it into a float the current state dot health divided by the max health now going back here, let's just feed it our... We need to, of course, add the player health. 
close these down. And then we need to feed the player health up here in the movement. And also let me feed the health slider down here. Okay, cool. So now let me try and run this. And let me try and hit this guy here. And as you can see, now our health got set correctly. And But a new health is 80. We got hit correctly. That looks fine, right? But let's try and look at the client here. And notice on the server, we only have 80 and 60, right? It only ran once for each hit, which is pretty much what you'd expect. However, on the client, we're seeing way more. We're seeing 80, 80, 80, 60, 60, right? And luckily, these are correct numbers because we predicted it correctly. But still, this means that the logic was now run... Uh, you know, four times here, you can see in three times here, you cannot really count on how often this is ran. And let's say that you had some kind of effect or a visual effect or whatever. Obviously, you wouldn't run it, want it running four times for every hit, you'd want it running once. So the big question is, how do we now do this? And well, essentially, you'd have to handle it through uh, the view update, right? So right now, we're doing it inside the simulate loop, but the simulate loop is not for visuals. As I said in the introduction in the very first video, we're disconnecting the simulation, which was the blue capsule and the renderer, or renderer that I showed you, um, where the visuals was the pink capsule that was sort of smooth and everything was clean. So we're essentially fully disconnecting visuals and logic. And so how we can do this is we can go instead into update view, which is pretty much where we handle all our visuals. This is also from where you'd handle your player animations, your slider and stuff like that. So we can pretty much run the same logic here. And obviously right now this runs on update, which means right now the slider technically gets fixed on update. This this whole logging thing was mostly just to show you that, well, predicted things on clients will run a lot of times. So it's kind of unpredictable and I wouldn't use that for visuals. Well, it's very predictable, but not for visuals. Um, and that's why essentially where the update view comes in for visuals. And we, we'll get into events and stuff like that later as well, because we do also have events working across the, the whole simulate loop and with visuals and everything. So... Just stay tuned for that. Um, but one thing that matters here as well is to use the view state. As you can see here, we've gotten a view state. We also have a, have a verified state. So it really depends on how quick you want things. So essentially the verified state means we have received it as verified information. This is likely what you'd want to use for something as if the player is dead, for example. So let's, let's say if uh, verified dot, uh, oops, dot value dot health is less than or equal to zero, then we'd say debug dot log player has died um, and also since this is a nullable value it's technically a good idea to always just check if it has value so if verified that has value and the verified health is less or equal to zero then we want to do that so something like for example handling a death you would very much want to handle from the verified state because you wouldn't want them accidentally let's say playing the death animation and then coming back right which is essentially what this does this is the predicted state which means this is what your computer is guessing and for the most part it's probably correct and probably fairly safe to assume that it's correct which is why we could do it for the health slider for example given that we probably want the health to go down immediately on hit you want to be able to see that but this can potentially cause jitter this could technically mean that let's say that we calculated the hit but the server disagreed well then the player would technically see very quickly that uh, they hit, the health goes down, but actually they didn't hit, so the health goes back up. So it would sort of jump back up immediately here. Uh, and you could also do other things, for example, given maybe we don't want to update the health slider dot value all the time, you could technically just check, uh, for example, and the health slider dot value is not the same as the view state. Uh, or I guess technically not the same as the result of this, pretty much, is what you want to check. It's not the same as the result of this, which of course, wants to use approximate, given it's a float. Um, but either way, you could, you could do something like that in order to only update the health slider when things actually are changing, because here we can rely on visuals. So updating health slider here. So here you go, now you can see they initially updated for each, which is great. And let's try and run into each other here. And boom, as you can see now, they updated. Well, obviously it, it calls twice because there's two players, but as you can see, it only updated once per player and it did on both. So all of a sudden now we can actually rely on it because this is visual logic which we can trust and we can rely on, and it's good for visuals, that is. Um, so that's exactly my point and exactly why you should be using the visuals. Now you can see things are nice and consistent between client and server, which obviously matters a lot for visuals and effects and sounds and whatever else you want to do, animations and so on. You'd want them to align. So there's no need to do any sort of syncing and stuff like that. It should be as easy as just developing a single player, but just know to handle visuals from the update view and handle the functionality from simulate. And just make sure to always go through the state and the input. That's basically the main rules to follow with prediction. As long as you follow those, 
um, you should be good to go. So hopefully all this stuff makes sense to you. Let me know in the comments what other videos you'd like to see. Make sure to join the Pernet Discord as well. And other than that, I just hope that you have a wonderful day.